I got this question about how to manage your emotions and feelings and how not to make emotional decisions. Now this decision was emotional. If it's done with your left side of the face, seven, eight, the left side of the brain will always. So this is how I did it uh, to master my own feelings and emotions when I need that the most. But first let's go back to see how the brain works. So you have two hemispheres in the brain. You have a right hemisphere, which is your social part that contains all that is implicit, uh, your empathy, your true empathy that uh, mimics other people's emotions that it sees through the left eye uh, on other people's area around the eye. It also contains your IQ and your Gestalt. Gestalt is how things are connected, how they stick together, and it's all done subconsciously, and here is how. So what do I mean by Gestalt? What do I mean by Gestalt and how the right hemisphere interprets things around you without you even knowing it? Well, this is a good example. If I draw two lines like this, you have one line there, and there you have another line here. You can clearly see that there are two lines here, but if I do this, you will interpret that as only one line, that they are sticking together and my hand is just covering up the middle of the line. That is your right side of the brain making assumptions. Then you have the left side of the brain, which is the dogmatic part of your brain, and that in 95% of humans contains your language. Although 95% of the population has speech in the left hemisphere, there are exceptions. And for this reason, it is necessary to map the geography of each patient's brain. The test also shows that the left hemisphere controls the right hand. Seven, eight, the left hand remains upright, controlled by the still conscious right hemisphere. In the right you have music, for example, and that's why people that stutters can sing without any problem whatsoever, but they stutter when they speak. But coming back to the left side, in the left hemisphere you actually have speech, you have dogmatism and you also have all the isms. For example, your left side of the brain is narcissistic. It's also feministic because it knows nothing else than what the right side of the brain has fed it to construct its mental model of the world. So. You can see this clearly in people when you have to use the exact word that they want and they use in their mental model, otherwise they simply can't understand what you're saying. They get quite upset. The reason why they get upset is because in the left side of your brain, you have the only emotion called aggression. Now, aggression can be physical aggression, and it can also be indirect aggression where you cancel people out without them knowing it by spreading rumors and other uh, lies about them. Now, how do we know that the left hemisphere is dogmatic and lies and blames everyone else? Well, it turns out when you do the VADA test and you sedate the right hemisphere, or you test this on stroke patients where they have a stroke in their right hemisphere and loses all the empathy and all that part. In a second test, a week later, the right hemisphere is anesthetized. Matthew, could you start uh, wiggling your fingers? Keep on wiggling, eh? And look straight ahead. You don't have to look at me. Look straight ahead. Okay. Now start counting loud and slow. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Given the opportunity, the left side of the brain will blame things that it has done itself onto others, which in psychology is known as oppositional defiant disorder. We can also say that if it weren't for the right hemisphere and the frontal lobe on the right side, you wouldn't have the ability to stop yourself from impulses. That is, if you have a stroke or a lesion in your right frontal lobe, you actually become a psychopath. Because if you, don't, can, if you can't use your right hemisphere and the frontal lobe, which is social, by the way, you can't sedate the left side of the brain while doing so. And this is the beautiful, intricate part of the human brain. When you think and use your subconscious in your right hemisphere and reason with yourself subconsciously, you produce a signal substance called glutamate that excites that side of the brain so that you can use it. But at the same time, you're producing a signal substance in your brain called GABA in your left hemisphere. And that sedates that part of the brain while the right part of the brain is functioning. GABA is also produced when you go and drink alcohol. And that's why many people depend on alcohol because it actually sedates them and they feel much better about, it, about themselves. That's why it's such a good product. You can also buy capsules for that uh, if you want to. Now that we know that emotions are a trigger refractory period and we know how the left side of the brain only contains the emotion of aggression, and the rest of the emotion most likely in the right hemisphere, we can now proceed to discuss how do we actually not act on emotion? To be honest, that's impossible because all, em all decisions you make are basically emotional. But there is a difference. Some emotional decisions you make puts you on a path towards where you want to go. Your personal goals, for example, to be healthy, to be happy, to be content in life, or to be social with other people. You might choose to be non-social with people, which is the left side of the brain that is dominant instead of the right side, which is the social part of your brain. But that's totally up to everyone to decide what is good and what is bad for them. It's not up to me to tell you if my values, my goals are the same as yours. You need to come up with your own goals. But in order to understand why we need to, to uh, set the goals first, it's because you can either move towards your desired goals or you can move away from them. And for example, if you want to live a long, healthy life, you might not want to drink alcohol, go out party all night, drink three liters of coffee, eat crap food and such things. If that is your goal, that is. You might want to move towards those goals by cutting out all junk food, not drinking alcohol, uh, training, and so, and so forth. Basically, it comes down to you can either do things that go towards your goals or against, away from your goals. And then you need to identify which emotions are driving you towards away decisions. For example, if you want to stay healthy and you have a tendency to when you're stressed to go and buy alcohol. Well, 
That is a moving away decision. And you then need to backtrack and see what is the emotions that you're experiencing when you feel the urge to go and buy alcohol, for example, a glass of wine. For you to do that, you need to be quite open and acceptable in looking at your emotion. And that can be done in a very simple way. We all know when we feel bad, but the trick is to stop ourselves and look at it what it is. One very effective cognitive behavioral therapy trick is to name the emotion that you're having. If I'm stressed and have anxiety, I might feel that I need a glass of wine to produce GABA to calm down. But instead of moving away from my goal of being healthy, I can then instead acknowledge and say, hello, Mr. Anxious, welcome back. What you're doing when you're drinking is you're suffocating anxiety and in the process thinking that you're actually managing your emotion, in this case, anxiousness, when in fact you're not. You're just pushing it away and the next time it comes up, you'll head for the uh, liquor store again. And that's not what your interests lie. You want to look at your anxiety emotion. And there's several tricks to that. But the most important one is not to struggle or obey, obey the feeling. Because when you go and buy the alcohol, you're obeying the anxious feeling and you then have a routine or a habit to go and buy alcohol to produce GABA and therefore make it go away. What you can do instead is not to obey the anxious feeling and not to struggle with it when it loops in your head and you feel awful. Instead, just what I said before, name it. I name mine, hi, Mr. Anxious, welcome back. For me, that's very funny. So when I see that I have the emotion of anxiousness, I actually pat myself on the back for acknowledging that I have the feeling of anxiousness and then I can observe what is happening inside me without even freaking out. One other example to understand the obey or struggle um, emotion is take up a book, hold it in front of you and push it away from you and do that for one minute and see how that feels. Usually feels quite awful and it's taxing on your body. The reason why it's taxing is because you're using up a lot of energy. If you don't want to use up a lot of energy, don't push it away like you do with your feelings. The good thing about naming your emotions, for example, here comes Mr. Sadness, or here comes Mr. Aggression, or here comes Mr. Rumination, is that you can access your right hemisphere so that you can reason with yourself is this a good emotion what is it for what is it, why does it come up to me again and again and again you can start to reason with yourself and understand yourself much much better one of the great things about identifying your emotions and your patterns how you feel these emotions is that you can then can reason and make the correct choices what you want to do if you struggle with an emotion it will take hold of you much more than if you don't struggle with it if you simply obey it and follow through uh, well it will come back again and again and again and you haven't taught your left side of the of your brain hemisphere anything new really or how to handle your emotions or how to deal with them now, many things that emotions are you, but your emotions aren't you actually. Your emotions are something subconsciously produced by your right and left hemisphere of the brain. And they are not necessarily you. They are merely there to protect you. 
and by protecting you, you will survive. That's how the amygdala works when it comes to fight or flight, for example, or freeze. So it's important to understand to disconnect from the emotion and start to observe it. We do the same thing when we do meditation. We don't push the emotions and, and thoughts away, we just observe them. We look at them and by looking at them we sort of pull up the fuse from them so they don't manage us, instead we are managing them. But here's the kicker when it comes to emotions that I've learned with myself. I started very young to drink coffee with milk and with four tablespoons, tablespoons of sugar. I loved it. The problem is, and I've noticed this with, with my brain, is that when I drink coffee, my, my brain produces more dopamine receptors not dopamine per se, which is an also a signal substance in the brain, which makes you happy. Instead, I get more uh, receptors, which in my mental world, in my left hemisphere, meant that I got more creative, got things done, and also I got the energy to produce things. Now, that's a false thing to assume that I actually got the energy from coffee. I didn't, I got more receptors from the coffee, but it also gave me jitters. It also gave me headaches because already after a few hours from drinking coffee, the uh, caffeine in, uh, stops contracting your veins and blood vessels, which means that they open up. So that's what you feel when you get a headache or a hat on your head, especially in the backside. That's why you keep on drinking so that you stay alert. Because if you don't drink coffee when you start, you will simply feel that something is happening in your head and you feel bad. Again, it's a feeling, it's a bad feeling. So when I stopped drinking coffee now for now two weeks, I've noticed that, well, first of all, I couldn't work the first day because I totally quit after about a liter worth of coffee every single day. Yes, it messes up digestion for a week, but after two weeks, I must say I sleep much better and the hat on my head every morning which is too much blood flow to the brain, that is gone. So by mastering your emotions and controlling them, well, not so much control them because you can't really control what your brain is producing. You can, however, reshape your brain by not struggling or obeying your emotions. We know this from cognitive behavioral therapy because when we do uh, MRIs on the brain, we can, we can actually see that the brain has rerouted itself after only six months, which is a great thing to know that you can actually reshape your brain and the way you go about navigating the mental model of your particular world. Here's some advice for you. Your mental world is not the same as mine. And it's important to know that because if you know that, you can actually stop comparing yourself to other people. Comparing yourself to other people is a bad thing. Foremost, because there are over 12 quadrillion different types of personalities, which makes people behave differently. And secondly, all these people on this earth have different experiences that have gone through their right hemisphere into the left hemisphere to create a mental model of the world that they live in. That is something that marketing, for example, uses 
when they manipulate you into buying things. Politicians use it as well with features such as priming. If you can prime a person with one set of viewpoint early on, that person we know from the evidence have a very hard time to change their mental model of the world that they have in their left brain. And that is something they play on because your left side of the brain is very dogmatic and will never let go of the mental model it has. But that gives you the information not to trust your left model of the brain. When it comes to the left side lying, it will lie to defend itself and the way it looks upon the world. You can clearly see this in leftist woke people. You can be liberal, I'm liberal for example, but I still can reason. What happens with many of the left extremists is that when you point the truth out to them, they get aggressive and then they start making up lies to protect their mental model of the world. And you can see this in American politics and in British politics and in any Western or non-Western country, basically. That's because the left side of the brain will always lie to protect its mental model of the world. That's just the way it is. But understanding that your brain is only there to protect you and that the left side of the brain is very mechanical in that it is sort of like a computer and that your right hemisphere contains all the social things in life like love, empathy, IQ, how things stay together. That gives you an upper hand in life because you will know where your thoughts are when you act the way you do in life. You can also clearly see this in other people depending on how they act in life. Most people nowadays are left dominant brains. That's because they are more aggressive and more dogmatic. You have totalitarianism, you have narcissism that is rampant in society, you have feminism, which we also know from the science community that it's pathological narcissism. That's because it's in the left dominant brain. The part with when we talk about lying and maintaining power, you see this in politics as well, when the socialist parties don't want to let go of their power, instead they want to keep it as close as possible so that they can rule over other people. That is the left side of the brain and in psychology we call that Machiavellianism. So the left side of the brain, if left unchecked without the right side of the brain, is Machiavellian, psychopathic, narcissistic and sadistic. It doesn't really care much about anyone else besides itself. And when we look at cognitive empathy, which is in your left hemisphere, it only copies what others demonstrate with their mouth. Because the left side of your brain is connected to your right eye, and your right eye of the brain looks at other people's mouths. True empathy, which is in your right hemisphere, has the affective or mirror neurons, which looks at other people's eyes and mimics the facial expressions from their eyes. That forces your mirror neurons in your right hemisphere to mimic the same expression in your eyes. And when you mimic your same expression in your eyes, your facial muscles produce the same emotion as you are observing. That is something you simply cannot fake. That just happens within you. So that also tells you that since the right social hemisphere is the truthful one, that means that 
when you look at another person's face, always look into their left eye and look at what happens on their left side of the brain. Because that happens subconsciously. They don't, they don't manage that themselves consciously. That is exactly what the person is feeling. So you can trust what the left side of the face portrays for you. But if something is not symmetrical in the face, for example, if I were to give you a half smile with the right, now this is deliberate. And you can catch yourself doing this when you watch movies, how your muscles around your mouth is moving to portray an emotion. You can also very easily identify if it's truthful or not, because if it's done with your left side of the face, it's honest, truthful, and it's what you actually feel. When your right side is portraying something, your left dogmatic and Machiavellian side of the brain manipulates your facial muscles to copy uh, others or just producing it for yourself. But that's not the truth. So for example, one emotional decision is to either eat a burger or climb this ski slope that has a vertical drop of 92 meters. While the choice is emotional because it's not so fun to walk up because it's very, very hard. But let's try it anyway. This particular bit is quite gruesome because it's such a steep incline. Now the worst is over, just 50 more meters and I have done a 92 vertical drop climb. So that was 92 meters and 300 and feet vertical climb. Now this decision was emotional. So by reasoning with myself in the right hemisphere, by relaxing, because you can't get access to your right hemisphere without relaxing, you can reason if the choice you're making is a good one or a bad one. So by choosing to strengthen my heart and do the right thing for me and my goals and joy values, I actually created a new mental model of the world where I'm fully capable of climbing a hill that is almost 100 meters or 330 feet high in one go. Is it easy? Of course not. It's not easy but it's a good way of exercising and training yourself to improve your mental model of the world in your left hemisphere. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one.